Some unique engineering to make it happen, but I want to climb. OBS crash. My name is Daniel Lennett. I study psychology. My favorite drink is scotch. As for my favorite activity, there's nothing I won't try once. Ready? One, two, three. In? Yes. Ah. Okay. No. Okay. I want to travel the world and try new things. We might need to do some unique engineering to make it happen, but I want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I want to scuba dive in the tropics. I want to see the wonders of the world. I want to see exotic animals. I want to learn about how people with disabilities live in other parts of the world. When a child is born and they found to be having any disability, they could kill the child. If I hear about a place where disabled children are left for dead, I want to find out if that's true. The mental strength that he has, anyone could learn anything from him. To do what he got so he click with him video gaming, that's insane, you know? So back on this way? Yeah, perfect. That's exactly <laughs> and turn like that. That looks really good, actually. I'm not afraid of danger. There's one thing you can tell by looking at me. It's that I'm hard to kill. Join me on Amped Up, a new series where I do everything that you're afraid to try. There's just, there's no stopping. So I, I just, this was sort of like a make work project. I just took stuff I already had and I tried to put it together as something pitchable and we were pitching it at, at Real Screen in uh, Washington, D.C., which we go to every year. And I remember sitting and it was the Travel Channel and the stage was like, we want to rebrand ourselves with new and innovative and, and edgy programming. And we want programs that have like a buddy, like like two dudes on a journey. And it's got to be dangerous. And we want to compose, we've got to like build things. And I like, and I had a show that was like, based, this was that show. And it was like every episode, there's a guy who explains how to technically build a thing and adapt it for disability and all this. And when, I, when he did the presentation, I was like, I've got the show for you. This is great. And he's like, oh, um, nobody likes disabled people on TV. It makes me feel bad. I was like, really? And I sort of got that from a lot of people when I was trying to pitch this in more, in larger networks. Everybody was like, nobody wants to see a disabled person. It makes them feel bad. And so I'm going back to the drawing board with this and I'm actually, I'm trying to turn this down to like a vice, super edgy vice series where we explore disability culture throughout the world. And it's not extreme sports related. It's just one of the craziest things you can sort of get into. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, a lot of challenges uh, with this. One of the things was, what what can we actually do? He's got no limbs. And he was a very good sport about all this. He's, he tried everything. You, you might have seen there where we tried to teach him um, MMA, but that didn't work out. That was, that was dumb, <laughs> you know? But like I was mentioning to you earlier, uh, sometimes failure makes for the best TV. And so we had a, you know, a one-armed MMA guy came in, and we, you know, it was really tough for Daniel. But it turned out that they were both video game fanatics. And they were both actually semi-professional first-person shooter guys. And so, and I didn't know this. It's, it, it, that episode ends with them fighting in video game. And Daniel's got no limbs and he beats him. So that was kind of funny. So we managed to get them to fight somehow. So, um, And the nice thing about working in the realm of disability, all broadcasters don't seem to like it, um, you can get a lot of stuff for, for free with these types of projects. So when we went uh, scuba diving in, in Florida last year, we got all our hotels for free, our, our meals were free, just because we're saying, we're making a TV show about the world's first uh, quadruple amputee to become certified over one scuba dive, you know? And everybody just started like, hey, have free scuba dive lessons, we'll take you shark diving. So we got away with a lot of stuff for free, which is good because we don't have a ton of money, right? Um, so one of the notes I have on being a venture filmmaker is, be ready to pick up and go, but don't quit your day job. You don't have to. You can call in sick all the time. You can use all your vacation time to, to make films, and I did for years, and it was it was awesome. Uh, 
please, please keep your passports up to date and, and <laughs> carry two forms of ID. So on Monday when we were flying to Vancouver Island, the person I was with didn't realize his driver's license expired. And we were at the airport at like 6 a.m. And we're like, oh, great, what do we do now? And it turns out that he, he had a the social security card with them and he was able to apply for a fishing license at, online on his phone at the airport. And now you can, you can travel anywhere in Canada with these two pieces of non-photo ID. So there's a little life hack. Get a fishing license. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> and it totally worked. It was crazy. Um, another thing you can do is get two passports. And what you can do is keep one passport for personal travel and the other passport, and I, I just learned about this, the other passport you can use to apply for different visas for different countries. So um, in February, I was getting ready to go to the Werner Herzog Film School in Munich. But I was also applying to get a visa to go film in Afghanistan, and you have to send them your passport. And apparently there was some sort of infighting in the, in the embassies, and they wouldn't get my passport back. And basically, I had to track my passport down, and I got it two hours before I left on the plane. And if I hadn't got it, I wouldn't have been able to go to Europe. And so I was like, what can I do? And then I found out you can actually have two passports, which is really smart for adventure filmmakers, because we're usually traveling. Um, and travel light. I, I travel really light. Like, I mean, I take like a t-shirt and some socks and some underwear. And that's really, I just take that used to keep my lenses safe. I've sort of found sometimes, like if you need clothes, and especially in third world countries, it's pretty easy to, to find these sorts of things. And it's fairly cost effective. Um, yeah, I, I, I tend not to check stuff if, if I can help it. Because I have been in situations where... Why did I check my tripod? It didn't show up where I was going. And so now I always travel with a small tripod, everything with me, so that if my, care, if my uh, check luggage doesn't show up, you can still shoot. Because sometimes it can be impossible to find stuff in remote locations. Um, so yeah, so, so, there's, so I sort of see the, the whole filmmaking thing. It, it, in my eyes, it's sort of like there's the creative, and there's the technical, and there's sort of the, the producing stuff. Um, but, the, but the creative end. Uh, one of the things that is important, I, I feel, is to tell interesting stories. So I always ask myself, does this project need to be made? And if, and if I don't say it needs to be made, I, I don't think it should be made. And, uh, and that's sort of a first step. And so we always say, like, is this a magazine article? Is this a, a radio documentary? Or does this need to be a film? And a lot of the time, you know, somebody has an idea and they want to do this film, it's like, actually, that's a magazine article. You just need a photo of a guy and write a little profile piece, that, and that's all it needs to be. You don't need to bring in all the cameras and, and, and do all this. And, uh, and I've found that that really helps uh, when you sort of look at it that way. Sometimes you can do a radio documentary. CBC does lots of this stuff. Um, maybe it's just a piece of written journalism, you know? Um, do research. Does somebody already, I'm, I'm probably, you guys probably already know all this stuff, right? This is probably not totally new. Um, Make sure nobody's already done it. I've been in that situation where I go, oh, this is a great idea. Oh, wow, that somebody literally just did that. That's why it was such a good idea. So <laughs> always the step one is to become an expert on what you're doing. Um, don't go on blind. I've made that mistake a lot of times. Always write out your, your, your documentary before you go in. If you, if you just try to go in blind, you're, you're going you're gonna to have a bad time. Um, if you have a solid story plan, then when the unexpected things happen, you can actually deal with it. And what Chandra was saying, log lines really help. Uh, I find if you've got a good log line, then everything, when somebody asks you, what are you doing, you can say what you're doing, and everybody gets it. And if you've got a really good log line, everybody will say, that sounds great, I want to see more. And when they say that, I think you know you've got a good log line. When somebody says, man, that sounds great, I want to see it, then you have a log line. Uh, and I always ask myself, like, is there a payoff for the audience if they sit through my whole film? So I always got to think about that transformative thing as well. And... And I like the idea of being tonally diverse. Um, you know, is, a, is, a, is an adventure film a, a guy climbing a mountain or a guy scuba diving? It doesn't just have to be this inspirational thing or this crazy thing. Have some laughter. Have some tears. Be serious, but be funny. Be tragic. I, I find that makes it a lot better uh, for an audience. Um, pre-interviews. Do pre-interviews. Everybody you're interviewing, wherever you're going, interview them on the phone beforehand. Please do that. It, it, it will really save you a lot of pain. Um, and when I find myself up against the wall, I say to myself, I, what would Werner Herzog do? And then I try to do that. And it hasn't worked out for me at all, but I do it. It's a good exercise. Um, 
Rem remember your audience. Try to figure out your audience. Your friends and you aren't necessarily your audience, and I've sometimes made that mistake, where I just rely on what my friends are into or what my colleagues are into and realize I'm totally missing the base with an audience, um, and, and get used to never sleeping when you're making an adventure documentary. Um, one of the things we did with the, the, the film that will be airing playing tomorrow is we did two seasons of Invincible, and it was, I guess, inspiration porn, as we call it. We didn't even realize we were making it. And our host was like, I'm, I'm sick of this. Like, why are people, why are, why are people clapping because I can, like, sit on a thing or, you know, I can play a video game. Like, what? what? This is crazy. And so we decided, like, we actually have to do something worthy of, of him being an inspiration. And we are like, uh, you, you've got to scoop it out of sharks. That's crazy. You look like a shark fan. He's like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> and so and so we did that. And now he actually feels a sense of ownership about it. He feels like he's moved out of the realm of inspiration porn. And now he's actually creating a new language for people to talk about. He's actually doing things that, that anybody could do, but they don't because they're scared and he's doing it. So I, I learned a lot of lessons about working uh, with sort of physical disability on this project and just sort of the inspiration behind them. And I, I don't ever want to make disability porn again. And I've made a lot of it, you know, and it's, it makes you feel good, but it doesn't always make people in the disabled community feel good. That's one of the things I didn't really know about because a lot of our audience were able-bodied. And, and so that's one of the things that I've learned about that. So why don't I show a little bit more. Um, so I'll just show a little clip from, like, say, the episode where we go skiing. I've made a lot of Does anybody have any questions about any of this or any comments? Please feel free to jump in. Absolutely anything. Can anybody hear that? I can hear it. This was scarier for him than Scooby Dead Insurance. I remember watching this movie with good reason, apparently. I almost uh, ate it coming off there the first time, and then we figured out, figured out when we were going out the second time that there was a pin restriction in the movement of the ski. Once we got that, there was a much smoother transition. Oh, so inspirational. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I almost got it playing. We uh, took the much harder to control, but once we start getting the speed, it's uh, a lot easier. So it's actually running down the mountain with a big counter stabilizer? <laughs> Can't tell though. So anyway, there's 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 some of the stuff that, that we've done, quite a bit of that that sort of stuff. Um, so when I when I travel I always have my uh, Sony FS7. I've always got some type of backup video camera, whether it's a DSLR or a C one hundred or something. I've got a GoPro, I've got a cell phone, I've got a good tripod, and uh, I, I really believe in a tripod with a good video head. Um, still camera tripods, just don't, they just don't cut it. And you can get a really cheap light ones from Benro, really, really cheap. Um, I bring extra media, laptop, hard drives, two wireless lab mics, three lenses, my reflector, and all of that fits in my 10 bar Brody bag with a tripod bag, no checked luggage. So. You can get full functioning, full on professional level documentary shoot with just a backpack. And then depending on the shoot, maybe I'll bring a lighting kit, a drone, a jib arm slider, and sort of check that when I go. Um, one of the things I sort of learned is don't be afraid to talk to the airlines about bringing extra baggage. 
when you tell them you're a documentary filmmaker and you're doing some cool stuff, they'll often be, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll pay for your extra baggage. And I've done a ton of that. Um, so always talk to your airline people um, and ask them about these things. Do they have things in place for filmmakers? Yeah. Uh, I'm a Canon glass kind of guy, plus I have a bunch of Samian primes with the cheap ones. So I usually bring a couple of primes in a zoom, a little bit of telephoto, and I, I can pretty much capture anything I need that way. Uh, Sony just came out with their new power zoom that looked pretty awesome. I'll probably do that. Pretty soon. Um, you can get creative with baggage too. Uh, I had this brilliant idea one day. I have this big crane with me, right along. And I bought a snowboard bag. I put the snowboard. It turns out you can check snowboards for free. And all of a sudden, I stopped paying for, like, it, yeah, it's crazy. I started stuffing gear in this thing. So, so find out uh, what is free and then cheap. It works. Um, That's what camera you used in there? This, uh, this was a C100. Uh, and it was mounted on a DJI uh, Ronin 3-axis stabilizer. So I was actually just running down the mountain with it, but it looks kind of smooth. Yeah. So, super handy, real pain to, to haul around. I brought it to Hyde Hawaii and broke it. That's good. <laughs> um, uh, however, uh, the next purchase I'm going to buy, okay, that was just too big for, for traveling, but right now there's handheld uh, gimbal stabilizers. You can put like a mirrorless DSLR on, your GH4 or your T3i, and you can hold it in one hand, and it'll keep things totally steady, and it can just fit in a backpack. And I'm actually going to buy that so that when I need to shoot B-roll, and I'm busy, say, following the main actor doing some action sequence, but I want B-roll, but nobody can hold a camera straight, because nobody's a camera guy. Well, I'll hand this to my wife. It should just hold it there. And it'll look nice and steady. It'll look professional. And so I'm always trying to find ways to maximize how large my crew is. If you've got somebody standing around, they can be a camera guy. They can be a sound guy. They can hold you a reflector. They can be a film producer. So, so it's, yeah. Um, Oh, uh, just on, yeah. on that. Okay, so you're you've been talking about all this all this gear and everything. Yeah. What's your process when you get a new one, a new piece of gear? Like, how did you? What kind of time do you take to when you get a new piece, or you get a new piece and then you're out shooting, or like, what is your process for really getting a handle on? I only get a thing that I need. Yeah. And they don't come up out that often. You know, so I'm, I'm usually know about it well in advance. And I'll, I'll usually just take it with me into the field because if a project gets financed, often I've got a very short window. Mm -hmm. So I'll probably, by the time it gets here from New York, I'm already on the plane. So I'll just take it with me and test it out. Um, so for me specifically, what I look for in my gear bag is what can I put on my shoulder? What can I do as a one-man band? Can I be the sound guy and the shooter? If I had to, could I hold a reflector and my camera and monitor the audio and get a totally <laughs> professional interview? And you absolutely can line up the right shot. You look like National Geographic if you if you put the effort in. And if you have a second person there, well, you can really pull off some stuff. So I like the FS7 because ergonomically, it's just, it's not like a salesman for selling. Um, I hated them before they came up with this camera, but it's it's just an amazing camera. Um, don't forget your appearance releases. Uh, pay, you know, I used to carry on paper, now you can get an app that people just have to sign up with their finger, and it's, it's there, and it's official. Um, always have that stuff. I've been... I've really made a lot of mistakes by not getting somebody to sign something. So I'm like, oh, I'll email them later. I won't take care of it now. And it really messes you up when you're applying for your error and emission insurance, which can be a real hassle. Has everybody done any O insurance in here? Oh. Well, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, I have, but it's for not fun. other, no. It's not fun. Like, for example, the CBC doc we did, it's not going on television. It's going on their like website and Facebook. It's 10 minutes long, and it cost me $4,000 to get insurance. And that's just in case people sue me. For what? Nobody's going to sue me. There's the three people in it. They know them. And they signed their life rights away. What a, and there you go. Just for going online. And these are the requirements the CBC has. So you always got to think about this stuff. So if you're shooting something that's totally awesome, that's controversial, and you're, you're doing some sort of activist film, and you're, you're putting cameras in people's faces, well, you're going to need to get them to sign a release form, or you're going to have to blur their faces, or you might not even be allowed to keep it. That messes up a lot of people in, in the industry. You got music playing in the background in an elevator and you're filming an important dialogue scene and now you can't use it because that music, the, the insurer is just like, nope, sorry, we won't insure that. Or they'll be like, it'll cost $20,000 insurance because that's staying, it'll sue you, you know? 
Same thing. So, um, <laughs> so, so anyway, always, always, for the adventure filmmaker, have release forms. Have a release form app and just make sure everybody that's in your shot just signs it. And then you don't have to worry about it. You'll thank yourself later. Um, as I showed you with my Hida thing there, always have insurance. Um, in Canada, I go with front row insurance. And the whole reason I got into the, the DOC Institute, like, like Shan was talking about, was because I was looking for a deal on film production insurance. And front row to Vancouver gave me a 15% discount if I was a member. And so the amount of money I saved on my insurance was actually more than the cost of the membership. So it's sort of like if you need yearly membership for your production company, then just become a DOC member. You'll actually save money and get a membership into it. Man. Is anybody here a DOC member? I highly recommend it because like you said, they have a listserv, which is like, I get like 30 emails a day from documentary filmmakers in Canada who are just saying like questions like, got a problem with my e &O, can somebody recommend a lawyer? But often that's the first place that people post jobs. I've actually got a lot of work as like, sometimes a grip, sometimes a camera guy, just out of following this, because this is where before somebody else puts it out there, we'll post it here. And especially if you're out east, there's a lot of work goes through there. It's rare it comes to Alberta, but I always get it, because I'm the guy monitoring these things. So everybody here should be a DOC member. It's, it's actually a pretty cool organization. And when you go to Hot Docs, they have a party for free food. <laughs> um, maybe a little bit contentious, but I, I'm a big believer in spy cameras. And I'm a huge believer in it. Um, cell phones are great. These are, these are great for, for doing hidden filming. But in a pinch, a little camera that, that is disguised as a button or a, a pen that I use quite a lot, like 50 bucks from China, it can be really helpful when you want to film something. You may or may not use it. It may or may not be legal. But if you just got to get it and just get it, spy cameras are great. And literally, I've, got, I've just got a pen. I just click it and, it and it rolls. Again, the ethics of that are a whole different conversation. But as, a, as an adventure filmmaker, it's good to have these, these tools. Um, phone plans. Wow, I, I wound up traveling to the States an awful lot over the last few years to film documentaries, and sure cost me a lot. Uh, Shit with the phone plan. Yeah. Have a checklist, and that's kind of a no brainer, but uh, I just started having a checklist because I'm sick of forgetting like, my batteries for things. Um, backups. When I'm in the field, I like to keep multiple backups. I've been in situations where things have gotten damp in your, your, your cards or your, your digital media um, stop working, or a hard drive demagnetized or a bag gets dropped. I know it sounds redundant, but I like to have three backups at all times. So I usually, all you need to do is 80 bucks for a one terabyte passport drive. I keep two of those in the original media, and generally I'll keep one passport, or one passport hard drive on me and then one of them on someone else. And if you're in a really hairy situation, mail it to yourself. When we were in Peru, I wasn't sure what would happen. What, what, if, what if we go to jail? What's going to happen? So you can actually just mail the hard drive back to yourself and just ensure that you've got a copy of it. So if you're going to go to jail, you want footage. You want to say <laughs> digits. You know, it's worth it. And, you know, it was really huge with medical insurance. Um, really big thing. So when we were in, in Florida recently filming uh, Daniel going scuba diving, uh, one of uh, his his personal assistants, who's always sort of with him, he got a brutal ear infection, and we only went down 15 feet, and we had to go to the hospital, and he was in pain, and it would have cost thousands if we hadn't just had some simple medical insurance. And I only got it because my wife thought of it at the last minute, uh, and it, like so that was really smart. Um, and on a side note, that was a really interesting shoot because I wanted the underwater stuff to look really good, and I knew I wanted a red epic, and so we thought, obviously, I'm not going to learn how to use a red epic and rent one, but let's, let's hire an expert who's an expert scuba diver, underwater shooter. And so we got actually a guy who's like an Emmy Award winning underwater uh, videographer and he came with us and it was, he gave us a, a good deal because it was about disability and it always gets you a deal. And, and it was awesome. We'd go in. It's great. And five minutes later, his camera stopped working. And luckily he had a backup HD but it, camera, but it wasn't the Red Epic. So that sucked. And then later that night he calls me and apparently it's his corneas imploded or something, and I was, in, and I was freaking, I was just freaking out. I was just freaking out. He's like, "This is gonna, this is gonna destroy everything." And it turns out that it was like sort of a long-term disability that he had mentioned to me only later, and so that didn't impact us. But he couldn't do it anymore, so he got another guy who was an underwater videographer, and he was really cool. And that's when we went shark diving, and we're filming all day, six hours. We're filming a few sharks come up, this sort of thing. 
And then, lo and behold, at the end, the, the one thing we wanted to have happen, the hammerhead shows up, and he starts swimming around Daniel. And right at that moment is when all of our cameras die. And they have four in the water, <laughs> and all four of them. All four of them died at the same moment. So I guess the lesson from there is have five back at camp. <laughs> six. Even the, the red epic, the battery died. He got out of the boat. It was very professional. Slamming the battery, went back in, except everything was out of focus. Somehow he didn't notice. So it was it was really crazy. The only reason I have any footage is because my wife jumped in with a grabbed a GoPro from somewhere and that battery didn't die. So we have footage from this one GoPro. And I had like four cameras going in the water. So so when when it, it's an important event, the more cameras you have the better. Have a spy camera going. If somebody's got a GoPro, have it going because you never know when something might happen and that GoPro is all you got. The whole hundred thousand dollars is all summed up in this one visual moment. So so just roll on it. Um, let's watch. Any any questions? I'm just going to see those sharks in, in your movie. Oh, absolutely. Sharks, yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it was a crazy moment. I, and the, the sad thing is, I didn't actually get to swim with the hammerhead. The guy was up there all day with the camera, but I was filming a guy who flew in from from Kenya, who is the he's in charge of. DDI, which is a international disability scuba diving, and he came in to properly teach Daniel, and so I was interviewing him in the boat, and then all of a sudden somebody's like hammering and hammering, I'm like, what? And then everybody's like, what? You know, and then all of a sudden all I hear is people say, cameras out, cameras out, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, what are you doing? Ca like, what's going on? And the, my co-director, my, my my buddy in Toronto, he, he just jumps in without a mask, like he can't see anything, and he like almost jumps on the hammerhead, like without a mask. <laughs> Without a camera? He's like, what are you doing? Like, yeah, it's like, oh, my wife jumped in there. It's really, really crazy. But it's really beautiful, though. Like, a, a GoPro in 4K can actually get quite an amazing image. Um, well, maybe you could just uh, riff on the whole safety issue for yourself. Yeah, safety. Um, it's important to be safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, the tendency is... Exactly that at the moment when you're there, like that's the last thing you're thinking about because you have this kind of invincibility kind of. Uh, we have a team, like most situations, yeah. we have literally the best in the world are there. So we have like the best shark guy, and right? The best disabled scuba diver. We have a team there, so I mean, yeah, the other director should have jumped on a hammerhead. That was you can't expect that, but but otherwise. I'm a big believer in having an expert there, so if I don't know it, I have somebody there. And chances are, contact them, we'll come and do it for free, just for the experience. Um, it's especially with something like disability and these sorts of things, because it's it's good for everybody, really. It's good for their resume as well. And so we had it. We had actually like three scuba divers come with us from Alberta, and then like another bunch from Florida. So it was, it was kind of overkill, but it didn't cost more. So it was, we were in a very safe environment, except for the sharks. It didn't sound safe. <laughs> and he climbed out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it wasn't safe. In retrospect, maybe it wasn't safe. But at the time, it seemed safe. Yeah. Um, so, so why what, what don't I show you guys? So, I'm, I've been working on this crazy project, like I said, about this, this wrestler, and I'm having issues getting you know because it's just so so darn litigious. But uh, why don't I show the, the the scene where we're going through customs? And it's it's very it's very rough, so please don't think this is in any way what the final form of it will be. Um, he has threatened to kill me in front of my wife. Um, we were in Tijuana in January. It was really really scary, way scarier than the yes, start. Um, okay, sorry about the language. So this is my partner who's in poor work with him, just sort of pretending he's not filming. This isn't going to be in it. This is just placeholder of like voiceover kind of stuff. So this is an example of him filming. Trust me, 
Yeah. Camera's yeah. covered. Yeah. And we're obviously getting stuff without him knowing about it. Shut your fucking mouth. Run, run, run. You're a fucking piece of shit. Shut your fucking mouth. Is this all right? Is this too intense? Since I met you, you're a rookie, acting like you're a vet, shut the fuck up, wrestling world. But He also breeds Persian show cats and he juggles them. And he has 50 of them. <laughs> yeah, I'm not joking. <laughs> it's kind of heavy handed here, but. Everybody that has this child has the same question we ask. So I would have That's going to get me in trouble? Why not? Service animal is coming on the plane with us, but we do need to check our bags. So. Uh, okay, what do you mean? So now I'm switching to a DSLR and cell phones for this stuff because people won't stop you if you got a DSLR and it looks like you're just taking a photo. Like, actually, like, give out some of these race to your endorphins, like, you have brains. So it's actually really good at the end around. Like, yeah, we can use more trauma issues. You're depressed. Everybody's here is filmed in the airport, right? Everybody's done it. Some of the quintessential stuff. See my hidden camera on her right there. Um, I didn't know that she had outstanding warrants for her arrest for her own assault charges. And so when I walked through customs, Teddy got stopped, and I was like, "Of course he's getting arrested. That's what we're here." But then she got stopped, and I was thinking, "Now, if the RCMP see the blinking light on her pen, and they know that the film crew is here, and we just spent the whole time waiting outside of customs, we're gonna get arrested." And then an RCMP guy came out, but an hour later, we, just, we don't know what's going on. And he says, give me your passports, boys, and we do. And we're like, oh, no. Like, oh, no, what do, what do we do? But then he comes out and he says, hey, I'm putting her in your custody for six hours. Take her home, give her a shower. Let the cat go to the bathroom. They're both being deported. Bring them back in six hours. So I was like, well, that's weird. And so, so it was one of those sort of risky situations. Thank, thankfully, it looked like a pen. I think I could have been in a lot of trouble here. But... But it's worth it. Like, you know, it's, it's, I wouldn't do it in either way. Okay. Thank you. 
all it's all real. It's really weird. Uh, I'll ask you a quick Yeah, super weird. But like, I consider that to be like adventure filmmaking, you know? I'm in the moment, I'm doing things that are ethically confusing, but I know at the end of it there's going to be a really important story uh, about it. And I've been working on this for like four, four, four years now, so it's, it's pretty wild. Um, which, which I guess takes us to the last sort of segment I want to talk about, producing, which which I think is the most counterintuitive part of Does everybody else agree with me that producing is like sort of counterintuitive? Does mm-hmm. anybody love it? Does anybody like love production counterintuitive? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're, we're um, I, I sort of found that like uh, it's good to know what, what your project is for. So like I know like with this, this is going to be an awesome festival piece of thing. That's what I'm going to try to do. But I bet, I bet it'll get into like a, a good festival. Um, but are there things that are good for you know, theatrical or for airlines or for museums? Um, I'm having some luck with like, my kitten TV stuff. Turns out airlines, like, like there's, there's a lot of different ways and if you know that ahead of time, it makes the whole process a lot easier. One of the things you want to do is find the money first. So a lot of this was just covered. Um, Canada has a lot of broadcasters. It's, it's actually a pretty good place to get funded. When I was recently in Munich at the Werner Herzog thing, there's 50 other international filmmakers and they like they couldn't believe when I told them about like our funding situation here. They were like, "No, I got to privately finance everything. It's all private investment." I'm like, "No, Canada, the rule one is don't privately invest." So, so that's kind of interesting. I, I, we can feel kind of lucky about it. Um, like see, CBC is doing all these digital so- shorts. Uh, telcos are like Telus are throwing money at community stuff. Um, Bell, Shaw, um, pitching at film markets is important. Red Bull is doing adventure filmmaking. They're huge into it. That's and you can go to an event and just sit down and, and, and pitch to them. And that's something that I've made it really important for our team is to like go to as many of these events as we can. And yeah, they're expensive and kind of douchey, but they're really important. So like we go to real screen and hot dogs and dance and anything else that sort of pops up. But you get to do like speed pitching sessions. Has anybody done that? Are you going to pitch for like five minutes? Like, and it's, they're pretty silly, but man, do they allow you to hone your pitches and and a year ago, I had a good one at Banff with, with APTN, and, and we just finished development, and I think we're going to get relit on a series, which is like, from a five-minute pitch, you know, it, it can totally happen. Uh, but one of the things is, like, I've discovered is, like, know your broadcaster. When you pitch a show to them, tell them, like, this is a great fit for you, PBS, on a Wednesday at 8 p.m., because your 7 o'clock just kind of fits with this, and then they'll suddenly take you seriously. And I've been, I've been sort of laughed at by broadcasters when I don't know my demographics on them, I don't know my target audience. Um, Knowledge Network just totally laughed at me once. They were like, you don't. Know, it's like, you got me, I don't. I don't. Uh, but then I went back and did the research. So that's, that's, that's definitely an important thing is to do your research on who you're pitching to. Um, and then if you're doing theatrical, um, you can always get pre-sales from the distributor, but they're people. Cool. Um, <laughs> I always, I always access my provincial tax credits, and that's been really good to me. Um, if anybody knows how to monetize something online, please tell me. Has anybody monetized something online and made a good profit? Just selling DVDs selling on DVDs. my own website. And, uh, but if, as long as you get, like we do stuff that's sort of educational, if you yeah. get into that market, they find you, then um, people just buy it directly. Like, like universities, schools. Not going through a distributor for yourself. Well, have a right. distributor, but the distributor went bankrupt, and then they gave yeah. us back our stuff. Oh, good. And then they, and then from now on, all our distrib- distribution. And the only reason we got distribution was to be able to get the right. funding afterwards. But yeah. then uh, they said, um, so then from now on, always it's like you can self distribute. They will distribute. Don't count on any money. You just use them to get the money. 
um, from the other funders. And then you self-distribute just via your own website and using social media and all that kind of stuff and just make your own DVDs. Costs like a thousand bucks, build that into your budget, make your DVDs. And now you don't, now DVDs aren't, well, they still sell, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I don't know. I, I, I experimented with the Vimeo on demand yeah. and uh, no, you make no money on that because anyway, so it's, you just have to develop your own model. But if you print a bunch of DVDs and you go around and community screenings and uh, festivals and that, that's where you make all your money. You know, you can make your costs back easily. Well, I, like, we were talking about festivals in the last class, and when I made the match for Bravo Factor, I mean, I still had a day job, and I was like, I want to do festivals, but, man, I can't afford this. It's going to cost, like, four grand to enter all these festivals I want to. So I entered once with, I had money prizes, and I made my money back. And I was like, wow, you can do that. If you, if you just, if you're really strategic about it, it's like, mm, this festival had a wrestling film once, and it, they seemed to like it. I'm going to go there. And I actually managed to, like, I think I turned a small profit off of it, of just going to film festivals, which is kind of insane, but it, but it worked. Um, I already said, like, sponsorship. That's a huge thing. Um, uh, my wife generally hand, handles it all the time, but she'll just call every location we're going to, everywhere we plan on going. It's in our, in, in our sort of script. She just calls and says, hey, can you help us out? And she saves us so much money. It's, it's kind of crazy. But, but that's sort of new to me, that whole element of it. Um, I've always liked to have a bit of cash on hand when I'm traveling. Uh, local currency can really get you out of the bind. Um, and go to every event you can. And be super friendly because you never know when somebody needs a camera assistant or a, a field producer or something. I've gotten quite a bit of work from just going to these events and pretending I'm really good at what I do. And I've, and I've, I've sort of fake it till you make sort of an idea. It's, it's certainly worked out for me. Um, that, wow, that's 5.30. Yeah. This, I only have like 10 minutes worth of stuff to talk about. <laughs> wow. Uh, does anybody have any questions about anything I've talked about? Is this helpful? Does this make sense? I feel oh, like yeah. all of you have the same experience I have too, right? Mm -hmm. Does that sound fairly close? No. I, I just think it's really great to hear, you know, that how it's working for you and what you've gone through to get to get as far as you have. Of course, I'm a Werner Herzog fan as well, so I would yeah. love to hear more about was it was it the Rogue School? Uh, it was, yeah. Wow. Okay. I just drunkenly one night submitted an application and then forgot about it. Months later, I got with this and I was like, "Can I afford this? What the heck? I'm just going to do it." Oh. And it was uh, a, a transformative experience. It was really cool. It was uh, really crazy. That whole thing about continue lock picking. But it's true. He doesn't. It's not a metaphor. I thought it was a metaphor. It's <laughs> real. <laughs> but uh, but he also he also brought in his his like, sort of famous cellist, who was just in from Carnegie Hall, and he scored his new volcano film like live. They just they just like he'd never seen the footage, and he ran up the rough footage of volcanoes, and he like scored it, and I actually got to watch them work together and how they communicate, and it was it was like little things like that were invaluable. I can't even express in the words like what how it worked. I just kind of took it in, and, it, and the most important part about an event like that, and I would go back, is, is the, the rogue cells, as he called it. He was very like, all of you, all of you go and get drunk tonight, and talk, and share phone numbers, and make your own rogue cell. And we did that, and now I'm in contact still with all these 50 people from around the world, I've got places to stay, and it's quite a, it's, it's pretty interesting, because everybody there's a risk taker, they're all like, if you can't get into a place, break the lock. There's no lockpick kit. Like, it's crazy. People have lockpicks and, and portable gas masks and things. Like, it was pretty, pretty crazy. And uh, I, I don't know if I completely agree with a lot of the methods, but, but in some ways I totally do. Do whatever you can to get the, the adventure film that you get. But be safe. But don't be safe. Yeah. Okay. Any, any other questions or comments? Well, okay. I just have one yeah. last. What is your favorite adventure film? My favorite adventure film? Uh, Do you have anything out there that, I know it's off the top of your head, but that inspired you or made you say, even if it was a crappy film and you said, I could do that, I could do that even better. Got out of the camp, Timothy Treadwell filming himself with a camcorder and a bear. That's it, and then he 
training by it. That's a crazy adventure. And then you go in and take the footage and turn it into this. It was like my favorite documentary. So that's what made me decide to like quit my job and be just like when I saw Crazy Man, I was like, this is sublime. He's <laughs> pointing at camera, it's in grass, it's slow motion, talking about the beauty of the grass. And it works. It's oh, I'll always do that one day. So Yeah. Thank you for listening, everyone. I hope that made you think about adventure and film. <laughs> Thanks so much. And uh, well, movies start at uh, six o'clock, so we can all have a little break, grab something to eat, or uh, and then uh, make sure you come back for the shag at eight p.m. It's gonna be awesome. Good for yes. Awesome. I, uh, I, I think they see it yesterday. Oh, but congratulations! Thank you. Uh, 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 oh, really? Uh, but she was seeing the Right, and you know, she said that, like, Okay. Well, she's going to, she's going to do the actual, 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 she's going